The topic of this lecture is eusociality. Eusociality is basically an extreme form of cooperative breeding and is seen primarily in insects in a diverse array of insects, but it's also seen in one group of mammals. So what defines a eusocial system? Well, eusocial organisms have the following characteristics. Cooperative care of young by helpers, which are usually referred to as workers or soldiers. Overlap of generation, so that mother, adult offspring, younger offspring are all alive at the same time. And if you think about it, these are the same characteristics associated with cooperative breeding, which was the topic of our last lecture. So what makes eusociality different? In eusociality, the workers are divided into sterile castes. So they're not just biding their time until they can become reproductive. In this situation, these individuals do not have the capability of direct reproduction. A caste is associated with different morphologies in many cases that are specialized for very specific duties. So in the picture here, we have termites and these individuals with the kind of nozzle looking heads, that's exactly what they are. These are Nasut warriors and they protect the termite mound by spraying caustic material on any intruder. In some ants, a single species shows a huge range of morphological adaptation. So here we see a soldier ant with a forager ant uh, on its head. So these are individuals of the same species. And a classic example of a worker is seen in honeybees, worker honeybees, which serve to take care of the nursery. They collect pollen and resources to make the honey associated with the hive. And they will also defend the hive with modified ovipositors into stingers, as shown here. As I mentioned, eusociality is fairly widespread in, in different insect orders. It's seen in the Hymenoptera, which include the bees, ants, and wasps. It's also seen in the Isoptera, the termites. It's seen in Homoptera, the two true bugs, which includes aphids. And a group I don't have on here, but we'll talk about the Thysanoptera, the thrips. One of the classic examples of a eusocial species is honeybees. And a typical honeybee colony is composed of the queen, who is the only reproductive female in the group, and her only task is reproduction. The rest of the hive is made up of between 20 and 40,000 sterile female workers that build and maintain the comb, maintain colony temperature, collect pollen, store honey, so a variety of services that are all directed into increasing the reproductive success of the queen so that she eventually is going to produce reproductive females that will be future queens and production of males to mate with the queens associated with other hives. Now Hymenoptera vary greatly with regard to their social system. I don't want to give you the impression that all Hymenoptera are eusocial. Even among closely related lineages, you see that there's variation. So this is a phylogeny of one genus of bees. And you can see that the different color branches relate to uh, solitary nesting species, some that are eusocial, and that's the, the largest number of the branches here. The blue branches indicate eusociality. Um, some are even polymorphic. So within a single species, these green lineages here are indicating within this species different populations will show different degrees of sociality. And this is fairly typical. If you look at any group of Hymenoptera, many of the lineages will show you sociality. So that begs the question, why is you sociality so common in the Hymenoptera? Well, one reason potentially is haplodiploidy. Hymenoptera have very different genetics that may predispose them to the evolution of eusociality, and this different genetic system is called haplodiploidy. What it provides is the potential for greater indirect fitness benefits of helping relatives because certain individuals are more closely related to each other than you typically see in most diploid species. And this was one of the main topics of research by W.D. Hamilton, famous from previous lectures when we talked about Hamilton's rule. 
So let's explain haplodiploidy. Females develop from fertilized eggs. They are diploid. That's not different from most of mating systems that you're familiar with. Where it gets more complicated is the males develop from unfertilized eggs. Males are haploid. They only have half the amount of DNA that the females do. Therefore, when it comes time for, to produce sperm through spermatogenesis, their cells don't have to go through meiosis. They simply produce sperm through mitosis. And as a result of this, all the sperm from an individual male are going to be genetically identical to each other. And that can have some huge consequences to hymenopteran relatedness. So let's look at those consequences. Daughters from a single male will receive all of the same parental genes. Remember, all of the sperm are genetically the same. So, sisters are going to be guaranteed to be related by 50% simply from dad's genes. They share all of dad's genes, which represent half of their genetic makeup since they're females and they're diploid. Daughters get the remaining 50% of their genes from their mom's genes. But because they have a 50% chance of sharing any single gene, 50% of 50% is 25%. So sisters are related to each other through mom by 25%. That means their total relatedness of sisters is 75%. 50% from the paternal genes and 25% on average from maternal genes. So let's look at the consequences of this in a hive of something like honeybees. So here we have a queen. Queens are typically larger. Uh, again, their main duty is the production of, of eggs. Reproduction is their sole activity, so their morphology is built for that. The queen gets busy producing female offspring. These are going to be the workers, and she is 50% related to those because she is producing eggs in the typical way of, of meiosis, contributing half of her genes uh, to the production of these worker females. But each of these sisters are more closely related to each other than they would be to their own offspring if they could be queens. So each of these worker bees are sisters, and they share 75% of their genes, versus the queen who is actually doing the reproduction, she's only passing on 50% of her genes in each of the individuals she produces. So therefore, the potential gains of fitness through the indirect component are actually higher than the direct component. Okay, let me make sure that you understand how this genetic system of haplodiploidy works and, and the degree of relatedness using this figure. Right here, we have uh, two chromosomes, chromosome A and B, that are found in a queen. And you can see that there are two copies of this because the queen is diploid. So chromosome A, she's got the, a blue chromosome, and then the other chromosome is, say, the red chromosome. Chromosome B, also a blue and a red, but it's given this different morphology just to indicate that it's a different chromosome. Now, when she produces eggs through meiosis, she is going to both cut down the amount of DNA in half to produce haploid gametes, but through independent assortment and crossing over, get different genetic combinations that are going to be the result in, in the eggs. And just kind of simplifying things here, forgetting the potential for crossing over, just looking at the potential for independent assortment, we see that she can produce four different gametes. Males, on the other hand, which are typically referred to as drones, the males can only produce one gamete. That gamete is exactly their entire genetic contribution, and all of those are going to be identical. So, if you follow the line here from the sperm going to each of these fertilized zygotes, you can see in the right-hand side that they're all identical. On the left-hand side, they're different. They have different combinations of the A and B chromosomes from their mom. So this is the same basic information from the previous page showing the four different possible combinations of gametes and just picking one of these at random to serve as the kind of the standard for comparison. If you compare the fraction of genes this individual has with each of the four combinations that are possible on the right, you see that in two cases the individual shares 75% 
of the chromosomes with these other individuals. Again, 50% of it's going to be guaranteed coming from dad, but they're sharing, in this case, one blue chromosome, and in the case down here, the red chromosome is being shared, the, the red B chromosome. In some cases, they may be 100% related, sh sharing both the same A chromosome and the sh same B chromosome. But in other cases, they may be completely unrelated, have absolutely no, nothing in common from the maternal aspect and only share the genes from dad. These are the four possible combinations, 75%, 75, 150. You add those up and divide by four, the average relatedness is 75%. So understanding how haplodiploidy works explains why workers are willing to work to increase the production of reproductive sisters or future queens. If they can significantly increase their mother queen's output of these future queens, they're gaining a huge amount of indirect fitness. Haplodiploidy also explains why only females serve as workers. Males are only related to their sisters by 50%. They don't have this genetic predisposition to benefit from indirect fitness. And so there are no male workers that are produced. When males are produced, it's only during the reproductive season, and these males or drones fly off to mate with the queens associated with other hives. And finally, workers are related to their brothers by only 25%. And the reason for this is the males have half the amount of DNA. Males are haploid. Now that may be confusing to you because I just said males are related to their sisters by 50%, but the sisters are related to their brothers by 25%. We're talking about the same individuals. How can there be a 50% in one direction and a 25% in the other direction? Again, it boils down to the fact that males only have half the amount of DNA. And here's a figure I hope will clear that up. So here we have a queen with her diploid complement of two chromosomes. Here we have the drone, the male that she mates with, to produce a diploid worker or potentially new queen, but a female that's diploid. This is just one of the four possible combinations. And let's look at the brothers produced from the same mom, the queen. And again, just picking uh, one of the four possible combinations of an unfertilized egg that she could produce. Again, the unfertilized eggs are going to turn into the drones. Well, let's look at it from the perspective of the male first. The male has two chromosomes. In this example, if you look over to the left, the red B chromosome, the hooked one, is one of the two that the brother has that's shared with this female. So 50% of his chromosomes are seen in this worker sister. But the exact same genetic complement, looking at it from the reverse, comes up with a different percentage shared. The sister has four chromosomes. Again, she shares one with her brother, but now it's one out of four. And so that's why the sister is related to this brother by 25%. The same brother is related to the same sister by only 50%. So not only does haplodiploidy make sense with regard to the potential genetic predispositions that might lead workers to help their mother increase her reproductive success so they can gain indirect fitness, it also sets up some sex ratio conflicts with regard to the sex ratio of reproductives that the queen should produce. From the queen's perspective, queens are equally related to the male and female reproductives that she produces. She is just producing eggs that are haploid. If she fertilizes them with the sperm from a male, they'll, they'll become queens. And if they're unfertilized, they'll become drones. Regardless, she's got 50% genetic contribution into these individuals. But again, workers are related to their brothers by only 25%, and these workers are related to their sisters, The, in this case, if we're talking about reproductive sisters, future queens, by 75%.
So the queens basically want a 50-50 sex ratio, while workers obviously get more bang for their buck with the production of reproductive sisters. So they want to produce more sisters. But workers wouldn't want to produce all queens because eventually males would be so rare in the population as a whole that if they did produce brothers, they would have a huge mating advantage. And it turns out mathematically what works best for the workers is to have a female bias sex ratio of three to one. So three queens to every one drone produced. So queens want a 50-50 ratio. The workers want a three to one ratio. Who ends up winning in this sex ratio controversy? Well, queens have power to manipulate the sex ratios initially by fertilizing the egg or not, by using sperm from the male that she mated with to fertilize her egg or not. If she fertilizes half of those, those will turn into females, and the other half, if she leaves them unfertilized, those will turn into males. So the queen has this initial power, but the workers have the ultimate power through brood manipulation. They're the ones that are taking care of the young that are being produced, and if they concentrate their care toward females and let more of the males die, they can have the final word with regard to the number of females and males produced. And in most species of Hymenoptera, we see a sex ratio closer to three or one to one than one to one. So it kind of indicates that the workers have the upper hand in this situation. But the story actually gets a little more complex because the workers are motivated in some circumstances to get it three to one. In other cases, they don't get such an advantage by producing more females. It all depends on the number of times the queen mates. So let's investigate that. I kind of simplified the previous explanations. The previous calculations that I was mentioning assume that the queen mates only a single time, mates with only one male. Remember I was saying that male produces sperm that are all identical, so the sisters will be related to each other by 50% from that source alone. Well, that's true if they share the same dad. But in cases where there's multiple mating, this reduces the average relatedness of sisters. So full sisters are related to each other by 75%, but if they don't share a dad, they're half-sisters, and they only share the genetic contribution that they got from mom, which is 25%. So let's look at the consequences of this in a species of ant in the genus Formica. In situation where the female mates with a single male, the workers do bias their help toward reproductive females, getting the final product to be closer to three to one. In lineages of this same species, where the female mates with multiple males, the workers do not show this biased investment and give equal investment to male and female reproductive. So in this situation, there is no sex ratio conflict between the workers and the queen. Well, how common is multiple mating versus a more monogamous situation in Hymenoptera? If you look at of diversity of species, and you do a comparative analysis of this, it appears that single male mating, monogamy, is the ancestral state in Hymenoptera, as seen by the blue branches in this phylogeny. This provides the appropriate context for the evolution of eusociality influenced by haplodiploidy. So this gives this genetic predisposition that makes indirect fitness so rewarding and could lead to the evolution of eusociality in many lineages. Other examples of the fact that haplodiploidy probably has something to do with that is other lineages of insects are also haplodiploid. For example, all forming thrips, thysanurans, are also haplodiploid and they are eusocial, where female soldiers defend the rest of the offspring in the gull. In this diagram here, you can see the individual on the right is one of these soldiers that is a sterile cast that is protecting the gull, allowing them to produce more reproductives. And again, this individual, by doing so, is producing more copies of their genes through this 75% relatedness. And therefore, foregoing direct reproduction really isn't much of a cost. But haplodiploidy is not necessary for, nor requires, the evolution of eusociality. Not all hymenoptera are eusocial. There are solitary species of hymenoptera that do not show eusociality. 
And as we're going to see now, there are also diploid species and other lineages that do show eusociality without having this fancy haplodiploid genetics. An example of that is seen in the isopterans, the termites. They have a regular diploid system of genetics, and in a termite mound, you see the workers are both male and female, very different from the typical situation that you see in the hymenoptera. As we saw, there was a genetic predisposition associated with haplodiploidy. There are also aspects of the breeding of termites that genetically predisposes them to eusociality. Termites go through inbreeding and outbreeding cycles that can genetically predispose termites to eusociality. The inbreeding makes individuals in colonies very similar genetically and therefore increasing the potential of inclusive fitness gains through the indirect route despite the fact that not all of the individuals are capable of gaining fitness through the direct route. Eusociality is also seen in aphids. Some species of aphids have sterile workers and soldier casts. Aphids reproduce parts of the year asexually, and so they're genetically predisposing themselves to have sterile casts through the production of clones. So if you're not reproducing, it doesn't matter because the individual that is reproducing is a genetic clone of you. And so you have a huge potential of gaining through indirect fitness if you can increase the reproductive success of the individual that is breeding since they are a clone of you. So in this case, soldiers will sacrifice their body for the good of the colony. This protects the reproducing individuals and allows them to produce more individuals. Some species of aphids show mixed relatedness in the gall. Immigrants from neighboring galls will come in into unrelated groups. And in these situations, there is much less representation of these intruders serving as defenders or soldiers. So if you look in different colonies of aphids, there's different levels of intruders, but in all cases, the intruders are showing very little representation and very little activity serving as defenders. The last example of eusociality I want to talk about also is in a species that's just diploid, the naked mole rats. In naked mole rats, 200 or more individuals will live in colonies found in very hard soils in Africa. They make very extensive networks of tunnels that can stretch three kilometers. And these tunnels are interconnected and dug in ways that the individuals are trying to find very scattered food resources, tubers. There's very little dispersal between colonies, and what this leads to in many cases is the individuals in a colony are highly inbred. There's only one female queen and one to three uh, kings that breed. Helpers are of two morphs generally, probably age-derived, where younger, smaller individuals work as diggers and foragers, and the larger helpers guard the queen and attend the young. And these helpers typically never breed. So in situations where it's, they are inbred, it makes sense, again, that there are huge gains in indirect fitness that can maximize inclusive fitness. But studies have indicated that not all colonies of naked mole rats are inbred, and you still see helping behavior in those populations. In another close related species, the Damaraland mole rat, uh, these populations so far have not indicated inbreeding, but they also show eusociality. So eusociality may make indirect fitness beneficial in some circumstances, but it's not the entire picture. So what else could be driving outbred populations of naked mole rats and Damaraland mole rats into developing eusociality? Well, let's talk about some ecological constraints. Severe ecological constraints can also predispose organisms to eusociality. The hard soil in mole rat populations are so extreme that individuals cannot predictably and dependably find food if they're living on their own. They need this extensive network of tunnels to be able to find these tubers. And it's too difficult for individuals to establish a colony of their own, and they're better off staying and helping relatives reproduce, gaining some indirect fitness, while still being able to find food and stay alive. Another ecological constraint could be the formation of 
an extremely elaborate nest or breeding structure as seen in termites with massive termite mounds. Offspring have very limited options for successful dispersal and direct breeding. Nest construction is simply too costly and breeding females and their offspring will both benefit by the offspring staying at home and defending future broods in these elaborate structures. So again, there are very limited potentials for direct fitness. This could lead to the evolution of individuals in many cases becoming sterile and helping their relatives breed and increasing their reproductive success so they can gain indirect fitness to maximize their inclusive fitness. This is also seen in ambrosia beetles. Females will gnaw nest into eucalyptus trees, but this is a very slow process. It can take seven months to dig a colony five centimeters in length. There's very high mortality at early stages of colony formation. Eventually, they can make these extensive galleries, but these are then very rare and valuable resources. So females that are born into one of these extensive galleries have a choice dispersal and direct reproduction, but again this has prohibitive cost in most situations, or stay at home and help to increase the fitness of the foundress female, increasing their indirect fitness dramatically by feeding and protecting the young in these galleries. So they don't have any options for direct fitness. By staying at home they significantly can increase their mother's reproductive success and gain indirect fitness. So in this lecture, we talked about the key difference between cooperative breeding and eusociality, and it's basically the presence of sterile individuals, individuals that have no hope of future direct reproduction. These individuals typically are found in worker caste that can sometimes have some pretty extreme morphological specializations for serving specific roles to increase the reproductive success of the few breeders in the social system. Many species of hymenoptera are eusocial, and this is due in part to their haplodiploidy, could genetically predispose individuals for increasing their indirect fitness gains despite their limited capabilities for direct reproduction. But not all haplodiploid species are eusocial. The number of matings by the queen is really key. When the queen mates multiple times, the potential advantages of haplodiploidy disappear. With multiple matings, the degree of sibling relatedness drops and the potential for indirect fitness benefits also drops. Haplodiploidy is also not necessary for eusociality. There are other potential ways of getting genetic predisposition such as phases of clonal reproduction and inbreeding. And finally, extreme degrees of genetic relatedness between individuals may not be the only answer. Eusocial species oftentimes also face some very severe ecological constraints that may set the stage for eusociality, such as barriers to successful dispersal and survival, at, like the hard soils play in different species of mole rats, or the construction of complex structures that are needed for survival and reproduction may increase the chance that individuals will gain indirect fitness despite having very low potential to go off on their own to make these complex structures so they have very limited capabilities for direct reproduction. And a good example of this would be some of the massive termite mounds.